what's up everybody welcome back to the receivables weatherlight edition i'm your host cedric phillips at cedric a phillips on all the things and i am joined by dad patrick sullivan da, 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 da. <laughs> at basic mountain on twitter dad. that's right is that a song yes yeah, the bluey intro song oh I didn't know that. Yeah, now you do. Okay, I don't know if I want to know that. I've heard the show's good. It's 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 very sweet. That's it, worth something. It's not grueling to watch if you're growing up, and the kids love it. Okay, that's all kinds of wins then. Uh, unlike Weatherlight, which is grueling to look at, and I'm not sure anyone likes it. Uh, maybe I'm projecting. I'm not sure. Yeah, I know. Th- this might be our first true, uh, real conflict here on the show. Uh, as far as the final score is concerned, which obviously we haven't gotten to yet, uh, but spoiler, I'm not particularly fond of it, and for some reason, you like it. Well, this set is one of those right place, right time moments for me. Okay. Because at this point, I've been playing Magic long enough and had sort of gotten used to playing in tournaments and read the inquests and scries about Ooh, building the best decks. The old mags. You know, as a student at the George Baxter Dojo, you know, knew all that. And... There's a lot to criticize about Weatherlight from a design level, just how alien it is to the rest of the block and uh, yeah. magic in general. Yep. That's fine. But I had advanced enough in my player journey at this point where I had an appreciation for, oh, this card and that card, could put them together and do something sweet. Or, oh, I could imagine turning this drawback into something powerful to do instead. And Weatherlight is just chock full of, oh, that's a cool thing to think about. That's a cool thing to think about. And I was at a time where that was exactly the thing I appreciated. Its connection to Mirage Block could take it or leave it. New mechanics, I didn't really care so much. But whether like felt like there was a lot of new stuff going on there because there is just a bunch of bizarre one-off build-arounds at a reasonable power level. Mm -hmm. And they were a bunch of cool cards to think about. So this is the first booster box my dad ever bought me uh, from the comic book store that if memory serves, he still goes to today in Ohio. Very cool. Which is pretty intense. Uh, shout out Carol and John's comic book store. And I think they're in a different city than when I was growing up now, but they're still cooking out there uh, in the suburbs of Cleveland, Ohio. So this set, in theory, is near and dear to my heart. And as I was going through this set on Scryfall, brought up some pretty nice memories. Of course. Looking at my old buddy Rogue Elephant, just yeah. thinking... That thing's got to be busted. Huge. One mana, three, three. You kidding me? Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's some other cards that are along those lines uh, that we'll get into over the course of the episode that do bring up some fond memories for me. But uh, as we do dive in, there are some things now that I'm older and mm, one could argue wiser that uh, are a bit of a miss for me in this set. But we don't want to get to all that stuff just yet. I'm going to grab my booster pack here. We're going to talk about the crack pack at the end of the episode, since we both got some weather light packs as well. But we're going to start this episode where we start every episode here on the Resleevables with the facts of weather light. All right, everybody, we are here for the facts of weather light. But before we get there, we, of course, are going to start with our wonderful sponsor, Tails. Of adventure. You can head over to toamagic.com and check out a selection of over 77,000 SKUs in stock, including 80 pieces of the Power 9, every single revised dual land, and 99% of standard cards for those of you playing in standard RCQs this season. Every order placed with Tales of Adventure comes with free track shipping. UPS next day and two day shipping is offered for orders placed before 8 a.m. And Tales of Adventure has completed over 1 million orders lifetime. So you know you'll be in good hands with Michael Caffrey and his staff. If you'll be attending an event that Tales of Adventure will be at when you're checking out, you can select the event pickup option. So you can simply pick up the cards you've ordered right at the event you'll be at. You can find a list of events that Tales of Adventure will be at attending on their homepage, toamagic.com. Lastly, when checking out, be sure to use promo code RESLEAVABLES to get 5% off your entire order. Tales of Adventure. Eternal lives here. All right, let's do it to it. Hang on. Stop one moment. Yeah. I want to give our viewers a little peek behind the back door. Is this? Okay. Just another Tales of Adventure story. I love to share them. So Cedric and I share the email address for the Receivables. And Cedric was picking up some cards. No, 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 no. I was picking up a card. A card. Thanks for the correction. Yeah. So I wake up this morning and I look at the inbox 
and I see, oh, you know, you, the automated, you, we received your order from Tales of Adventure sort of thing. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, Cedric bought something. Go check this out. So I open up the email and it's just one copy of a fourth edition Iron Claw Orcs mm-hmm. for 49 cents. Was promo code resleamables used for four cents off? You better believe it. Just a really delightful way to start my day. Anyway, please continue. Eternal lives here. That's <laughs> where it lives. Now, nice to know they round up on the store credit because it was only 49 cents, but they gave you the extra penny on your promo code. Shout out Michael Caffrey. Michael Thanks, Caffrey, buddy. the best to do it. All right, let's dive into the uh, let's dive into the facts now that I've been uh exposed. <laughs> <laughs> Weatherlight is the 11th Magic the Gathering expansion. It was released on June 9th, 1997. And a fun little fact here is that it was retroactively released on Magic Online on December 12th, 2007, with release events beginning on December 14th, 2007, because they released Mirage Block uh, kind of all at the same time on Magic Online. In the same way they're working backwards on Arena, they were doing that on Magic Online, too. Right. So, uh it was a third set and the second small expansion of Mirage Block, which uh, we're going to talk about here in just a second. And it kicked off the Weatherlight Saga, one of the biggest storylines in Magic history. So if you're a Vorthos or a Lore fan, uh, this is kind of what got like the Weatherlight crew and uh, all the other stuff going on with that, which I'm certainly no, uh, I'm no Magic historian, but I know that's a big deal to a lot of people. I mean, if you compare, you ask, you know, a, a low to medium investment Magic player, what the story is with Apocalypse Chime. Yeah. Or any of those kind of one off story B cards, maybe even someone like Lim Duel. Yeah. You're probably going to get a pretty shaky set of responses from people. The Weatherlight is has stood the test of time. And not only the Weatherlight itself, but the individual characters are a really significant part of Magic's lore today. And I remember thinking that this was the first time that I could really latch on to the thing that they were talking about. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's talk about who designed and developed the set. Get that out of the way real quick. Designed by Dan Cervelli. He was the lead uh, alongside Mike Elliott, Joel Mick, and a new name here, Tiawin Woodruff. Tiawin, I hope I'm pronouncing your first name correctly. Uh, it was developed by Mike Elliott, who was the lead alongside William Jokic, Bill Rose, Mark Rosewater, and Henry Stern. And as always, the art direction was led by the one and only Sue Ann Harkey. Weatherlight contains 167 black bordered cards. We got 50 rares, 55 uncommons, and 62 commons. So not the uh, not the biggest of sets. Uh, that is pretty heavily indexed on rares as a set of the distribution. Yeah, I I, I think that if you were to go back, you would probably want to you would consider removing 10 rares for five more commons and five more uncommons. Okay. Functionally, it just means I think the rares in the set are a little bit too hard to collect. And you see the same commons over and over again if you're opening boosters, but it's not the biggest sin. Just kind of a an uncommon distribution of the rarities. Got it. Uh, Weatherlight's expansion symbol is an open book, otherwise known as Thran Tome, which is a card in the set. Now, uh, again, for you Vorthos and uh, lore fans out here, the Thran Tome is an important artifact of The Legacy, a collection of artifacts assembled by Urza that work in conjunction to defeat Yawgmoth. Uh, now, there's going to be more to that story in future episodes because the Weatherlight Saga, uh, this is not a short story. It goes across a lot of sets. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, The Legacy, as it were, again, a collection of artifacts assembled by Urza, got to defeat Yawgmoth, who is a pretty problematic uh human being i suppose uh and then the thran tomes contents they change depending on who reads it and among the information contained in the tome are the components and intended operation of the legacy itself so a very important book and uh i don't know i would figure that the weatherlight uh expansion symbol would be like a ship yeah i think this expansion symbol is really great just not here yeah i think it's a cool symbol an open book with looking like you're leafing through pages could be used any number of places. Yeah. This is pretty inefficient in my mind because, yeah, where why not just do the ship or something? Yeah, that's, I don't know, that's what I think, but it's an easy thing for me to say now. Uh, Weatherlight was sold, hang on, let's get, where did I, where did I put it? Here it is. This thing is sold in these booster packs, and that's it. Uh, one rare, three uncommons, 11 commons in this 15-card booster. And unlike previous sets, and we've covered quite a few here on this show, 
Weatherlight boosters featured the same artwork, Steel Gollum. That's it. A Which dealer. Is, yeah, I mean, card's fine, whatever, and the artwork is good. I'm just a little surprised that they didn't continue to take the approach of a couple of different pieces of artwork. Yeah, they're kind of going back and forth at this point. Yeah, it doesn't seem like it's uniform on what they want to do there. And I will say, with in particular with this set, something's going to stand out to you here that I'm going to directly point out as we go through this, but it seems rather disconnected from a lot of the other things that are going on here, of which I don't know why, uh, and maybe we'll disagree on that. So refresh my memory with Visions and Mirage, okay. because I do know there was a point in Magic's history where the large set expansion your Tempest or your Urza Saga yep. had multiple pieces of art on the boosters. And then the smaller expansions like Stronghold or Urza's Destiny only had the one piece of art. All right. So Visions to Fairy's Puzzle Box. That's it. And then Mirage. Yeah. If Mirage has multiple pieces, I think that's the thing that's going on here. All right. Mirage has five. Yeah. So multiple arts on the big set and then one art on the small. Okay. Okay. Is that is that worth doing or not? I, you know, whatever. But I think that's the... That's the pattern here. Uh, and then Weatherlight had four theme decks. You could also call them pre-cons if you'd like. Now, a unique thing about this is that paper versions of these theme decks, again, you can call them pre-cons if you'd like, do not exist because the concept of theme decks was not implemented until Tempest Block. So Weatherlight theme decks were designed retroactively for that Magic Online release that I talked about earlier when they uh, fired off Mirage Block on Magic Online. So we got four decks, and we're not going to go over the contents of the deck list. I just want y'all to be aware that these exist. Our first one here was called Dead and Alive. It's a mono black deck, and the two rares in the pre-con were Infernal Tribute, and I believe it's pronounced Morinfin. Yeah. Morinfin? Okay. Uh, the second one is Fiery Fury. It's for you mono red fans out there. And the two rares were Firestorm and Heart of Bogarden. We've got a white blue flyers deck. It was called Air Forces. The two rares in that were Alabaster Dragon and Dead of Loyalty. And last, but certainly not least, we have Gate Crashed, which is a red green deck. And the two rares in there were Aberroth and the very buff and swole Miraxis of Keld. Mm -hmm. So um, in Tempest Block, when we get there, which is coming up soon, by the way, we'll start to see stuff like pre-cons and theme decks and everything else. But uh, retroactively creating these as a way for people to jump in on Magic Line. I don't know. Makes some sense. Probably wasn't that hard to do. Yeah, I, I, I think you're just saying if you can get people to misclick into paying $10 for a Marfine or whatever. Okay. Doesn't seem very useful to me, but I wasn't really... Didn't really harm me. I wasn't paying attention to it. <laughs> well, it's interesting, right? Because there are some products that are for us and there's some that aren't. So you know, like a theme deck or a pre-con, you can play Magic Forever. I don't even know they exist or anything like that. But for some folks who might be starting or, or have played for a little bit and just really like them, they might see they might be actively seeking that product and just being like, I wonder what the pre-cons are for this set, right? Sure. Uh that's different than the Weatherlight Magic Online release. We agree. Yeah. It's yeah. 10 years after the fact, and none of these cards have any utility in any format. Yeah, we made these, though. Are we playing Weatherlight standalone pre-con constructed or whatever? Maybe we should, I guess. That's a video we can make. So it's fine. I don't want to belabor the point. I don't know all the details here, but this is a dubious product. I was going to say, let us know in the comments if you want us to make that video. Don't. Yeah, we're not doing don't that. Don't let us know, because we're not doing that. Uh, those are the facts of Weatherlight. Simple, straightforward. I don't really have anything interesting to tell you. Right. Yeah. It's about as simple and as straightforward as it gets, which uh, makes it feel, at least to yours truly in the hat and hoodie here, that maybe they were rushing this one out the door a touch. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Patrick will disagree. But here's what I can tell you. We're done with the facts. We're going to move on to the lore and the Vorthos right after this. All right, everybody, we are here for the lore, the Vorthos, the vibes of Weatherlight. Um, when we've done this portion of the show, sometimes it's really long. I'm still thinking of my, my buddy, Baron Senior. Oh, yeah. Just running rampant. Uh, this one's a little bit shorter, but this does kind of, again, start the, uh, the Weatherlight saga. So uh, here's what I have for you. 4,000 years after Urza and Mishra reopened the portal to Phyrexia, 
The evil Lord Yawgmoth sits poised to invade his one-time home, Dominaria. The plane's only hope for survival is a cache of powerful artifacts known collectively as the Legacy. When put together to assemble a powerful doomsday weapon, these artifacts will have the potential to destroy the dark powers that will try to invade the planet. Now, if I had to guess, this would probably be the card legacy weapon. Yes, in Apocalypse. Yeah, that would be my guess. Uh, the focal point of this weapon is a flying ship called Weatherlight, and its intrepid crew searches the planes to find all of the pieces of the legacy before the invasion commences. There's also a magic set named Invasion. I'm happy to help. Only the reluctant leadership of, all right, how do we pronounce this guy's name? Gerard? Yeah, Gerard. Gerard, Gerard what? Capuchin. Okay, Gerard Capuchin. Nice. Uh, and the skills of Squee the Cabin Boy and Tangarth, the hulking Minotaur, will save the day. It doesn't help that Captain, I like to call Sisse. Yeah, Captain Sisse. Captain, is it Sisse or Sisse? Yeah, Sisse. <laughs> Captain Sisse. Okay. Because I used to say Captain Sisse when I was a kid. Not the first time that, uh, Sisse's name has appeared on a card. Okay. Because we have Sisse's ring in Visions. Oh, yeah. yeah. You're crushing it today. I know. You fire. really are. We'll talk about when we get to the mechanics, but I'm dealing. Okay. I'm dealing. Uh, Captain Sisse has been kidnapped, and they have to travel to the Plane of Wrath, which is, I think, where like Tempest is. That's Wrath Correct. Block. Yep. Uh, to save her before they can complete their destiny. And Gerard, of course, will have to live up to his own overwhelming responsibilities by facing his blood brother, Vuel, V-U-E-L, who has changed his name to Volrath and sold out any semblance of goodness he had by becoming Yogmoth's first in command. Okay, so we're starting the Weatherlight Saga. Cool. There's some characters we've heard of there. If you've been playing Magic for a little while, like Gerard and Sisse and Squee, uh, Volrath, Yogmoth, all that stuff, right? This is the third set of Mirage Block. Yeah. This has nothing to do with the Mirage story. Is that worse than the fact that none of these characters appear in the set? <laughs> it's like, oh, there's all these awesome characters and storyline artifacts. Yep. Okay, where <laughs> I've opened up three packs. I haven't seen any of them yet. You nope. Let me know where they are. <laughs> no. Every character I mentioned is not in here. The best I can do for you, I think, is Gerard's Wisdom. Yeah. Which is that white card? Yeah, two dub dub. Sorcery for each card in your hand, you gain two life. Yeah, n but all of those characters just mentioned, yeah, not in here. Very weird. And again, if you were with us for a Mirage episode, if you weren't there, you should go check it out. We'll take that hit and that like. Thank you very much. Also, subscribe to the channel. Uh, if you look at the Mirage uh, lore, which I went over the flavor and the storyline, uh, so we're set in like, this African themed jungle thing called Jamura, and it's got some nations like Zalfir and Femoref and Sequata. Uh, and then we're talking about Teferi and Mangara and Jorial and Karavak, and it's like none of these people are none of these people are mentioned anymore. Also, this the sets could just use more legendary permanents anyway. So sure. Like, why are we yeah? So I don't understand what happened here. Now, as I did mention in the facts section. And I'll and I'll say it again. Uh, this set, oh, where is it? It was it was built and created like independently of Mirage and Visions, which is not necessarily the worst thing. Okay, but if you're going to do that, it probably should be set one of a block. I agree because if someone's working in isolation, they turn over whatever their set looks like. Sets two and three, they can just be piggybacking off that structure. Yeah. Doing it in set three, when you don't know what sets one and two look like, gets you to the point here where it's completely disconnected other than some old mechanics that are kind of shoehorned in on random designs. Which we'll be talking about here in the next section. So, look, if you think that lore and storyline and flavor and stuff is cool, awesome. I think it's totally fine, and it does do a nice job of setting up the scene for frankly a lot of sets to come yeah right because those are characters in wrath and is it called wrath block or wrath cycle it's known as i mean i've heard both? both okay yeah. so you know like tempest exodus uh stronghold urza's block all this stuff right invasion block we're gonna see all these characters more but it's just weird that it started here because it's the third set of, Mir of mirage block except it's definitely not so anyway that's the lore that's the storyline that's the vorthos yeah it's also a little rough that you know 
as you mentioned, those two blocks afterwards are pretty disconnected from Weather Lake 2. Yes. Once we get to Mercadian Masks and Invasion, those characters start getting filled out. Okay. Those are those two blocks have a lot of Weather Lake inspired characters and themes in them, but you kind of miss the mark a little bit when it's two and a half years later that you start cashing in on any of the anything that you've built up here. Yeah. Um, it speaks to a disorganization that was there. I Something guess. that does not happen now at all. So, yeah. uh, okay. So, Vorthos lore, storyline, flavor, blah, 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 whichever word you want to use. Dunzo mechanics coming up. All right, everybody. Let's dive into the mechanics of Weatherlight, shall we? Now, as I have mentioned a couple of times over the course of this episode, Weatherlight was designed independently from the group that designed Mirage and Visions, which if uh, you watch the flavor and storyline aspect of this episode, and we're here for the facts as well right before that, that probably doesn't surprise you too much. Um, but here's the thing. It was decided internally that for coherency reasons, that the folks that were designing the set should use elements of the earlier two sets to make the third set feel like part of the block. Except for, you know, the world they're in. So they fired up some old mechanics. Yeah, it's really great imagining you're working on this thing by yourself and you got all these like cool cards. But you're working by yourself. So in the back of your mind, you know, it's not like super compatible with the sets that came before. And maybe someone's going to come in and pull rank at the last minute. And then someone from the Mirage or Vision team comes in and it's like, yeah, you know, we're going to have to get you to add a lot of cumulative upkeep and banding in this set, so mm -hmm. it looks like it's part of the block. Oh, and they, they did that, <laughs> by the way. So, uh, Weatherlight contains no new mechanics, but it contains plenty of old mechanics. Like Patrick mentioned, banding. We got two cards with banding, both in white. Banalish Infantry and Volunteer Reserves. Now, I ask you, my friend, do you know Volunteer Reserves? I think it is a, is it White Colorless? Two four banding cumulative upkeep one. That's correct. I actually like that design quite a bit. Okay. Because if some boss came to me and said, "You got to just put a bunch of cumulative upkeep and banding in the set so it looks connected," mm -hmm. I'm putting that on one card. Yeah. Yeah. You're not gonna make me. You're not gonna make me ruin two of my babies. I'm just gonna load that that dump truck. I'm gonna back it up on one. Yeah. And I'll do that as much as I possibly can. I like that they put two horrible abilities on one card. So, cumulative upkeep, we got quite a few here. Lucky us. Uh, in white, we have Inner Sanctum, uh, Revered Unicorn, and the aforementioned Volunteer Reserves. In blue, we have Ancestral Knowledge, Mana Change, which grants cumulative upkeep on a creature, uh, and Psychic Vortex. In black, we have Gallo Braid, Mornfin, and Wave of Terror. Red, you've got Heart of Bogarden. And then in green, we have the mighty Aberroth, Arctic Wolves, and Utabi Ifrit. Do you know why they didn't make a design here with both uh, phasing and cumulative upkeep? Because they wanted us to keep playing magic. Like, how does that work? Yeah. I don't know how that works. I don't have the slightest idea. <laughs> and neither do you. You can <laughs> no say one, that you do, but no you don't. One does. You know what no I mean? one yeah. does. Uh, speaking of phasing, we got two cards there, both in blue. Air Ties Familiar and Talarian Drake. Flanking, decided we wanted to do this again. Black with Shadow Rider, and there's an artifact called Jabari's Banner. I don't know who Jabari is, and I don't know why his banner grants flanking, but it does. So there's that. And uh, do I have any? Oh, and then, uh, yep, here, this is where you, this is where you shined. So in my notes, I was like, yo, they introduced like the Graveyard Matters stuff, some ordering here, right? Uh, because I've got three cards. Uh, and that refer to the order of cards in a player's graveyard. I got Necrotog, that's Spinning Darkness, and I got Zombie Scavengers. And Patrick said, nah, nah, they've already done this before. Go back to Alpha, you have Nether Shadow, cares about graveyard order. Move up to Alliances, you have Death Spark, mm -hmm. cares about graveyard order. Uh, this set certainly has a lot of it. And interestingly enough, this is a place where Magic has different rules depending on the format that you're playing. Magic stopped doing this pretty soon there after the fact. Maybe this was the last set where the Graveyard Order matters. Okay. And so after that, the rules could accommodate your Graveyard Order doesn't matter. You can just shuffle it up and who cares? Yep. But if you're playing Vintage or Legacy where these cards are legal. It does matter. You do have to keep your Graveyard Order intact. So yep. Magic does have to 
different rules depending on what format you're playing. So, uh, mechanically, that's what's been brought back in the set. Not particularly exciting, right? Banding, commune of upkeep, phasing, flanking, graveyard just order. A, just a who's who of Magic's most beloved mechanics yeah. throughout the years. What's exciting about any of this stuff? Uh, practically nothing. If I had actually pick which one is of those is my favorite, I think it's flanking. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty innocent, at least. It's the, it's the easiest to understand. Reverse Rampage? Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's what they should call it. Little R&R. Yeah. Uh, all right, you know, our past couple of episodes that we've done, 5th edition and Portal, we didn't have any games to play, mm -hmm. but now we oh, do. Oh, no. It's game time, buddy. Okay. Uh, creature types introduced in this expansion, and then some of them are later changed due to the great update. So... You know the drill. Uh, our editor, John. Uh, let's get out the dings and the counters. See how Patrick does here. I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I got eight cards. This should be, this is light work. Okay. All right. Aberroth, later changed to Elemental. Aberroth. That is correct. Avazoa, later changed to Jellyfish. Avazoa. That is correct. Barishi, later changed to Elemental. Barishi. That is correct. Behemoth, later changed to Elemental. Um, Benthic Behemoth? Incorrect. Llanowar Behemoth. Okay. Uh, Gatekeeper, later changed to Horror. Abyssal Gatekeeper? That is correct. Peacekeeper, later changed to Horror. Okay. Thundermare, later Thundermare. changed to the Horse. Somebody's getting cocky. Undead, later changed to Horror and Wraith. Hmm. Is it Hidden Horror? That is incorrect. Okay. It is Urborg Stalker. Okay. Uh, that, to me, let me check the score here. I think you got six. I got six. One, two, three. That's six out of eight. That's not bad. A lot of those were gimmies. Bissell Gatekeeper took a little. That was a little work. That's a fringy or one. a little work there. Yeah. Uh, so, those are your new creature types. Those are your new mechanics. And that's all I have for mechanics. Boring. Great. Boring. So, so far, we're through facts where I don't have anything really of interest to share. We go through, we've gone through the lore, which is completely disconnected from Mirage Block, but also not really that connected to Tempest Block. There's one more, me I would argue, is a mechanic of sorts. Okay. Uh, it's the design space I like to call mandatory fun, <laughs> which is okay. something uh, overrate. With a power that's balanced around the thing dies if you don't do the good thing. So Harvest Worm. Okay, that's a green card. Go yeah. to Harvest Worm. All right, got it. It's probably between us right now. Yeah. All Make right, so we got ourselves a two mana, three, two. Summon Worm. When Harvest Worm comes into play, return any basic land card from your graveyard to your hand or bury Harvest Worm. So you get a three, two for two and draw a card. That's like so overrate for the time. Yeah, it's like sort of draw a card. Right, but it's... Balance around the fact that it's really hard to do the thing. That's true. There was a, I've mentioned this card before, but back when I was working on World of Warcraft trading card game, they loved mandatory fun. The people that I worked with. <laughs> okay. And so there was, <laughs> this example is way worse than Harvest Worm. But, okay. Um, World of Warcraft was direct attacking. Yep. So instead of a combat phase where I attack with whatever I want to attack with and then you block, it's this spe this specific creature. Attacks individually at you or one of your creatures that you have available. Yep. So there was a card in the second set that was overstatted and had a keyword, like well over rate, and said when this attacks, uh, kill target tapped creature. And it's like, oh, this is so, so sick. It could, so it could kill itself. But it, if it was the only tapped one, it just killed itself. So I read this thing I wasn't working on. I was working on a different game at the dummy at the time. Okay. I was like, is it intended that this just kills itself all the time? Yeah. And they're like, yeah, that's what it's balanced around. Oh, okay. like, that's that's not how that works. You gotta you gotta get rid of everyone here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You gotta start over. Balance. Okay. At least harvest worm says or bury harvest worm. Yeah. It kind of clues you in that you do have to do the thing. But I've seen a lot of examples over the years of, I know what's going to be fancy. 
is a mandatory <laughs> it's a mandatory advantage but there's something underneath the hood that makes it a disadvantage if you can't do the thing but no one reading it the first time would ever believe that that was what was going that on. wouldn't come up except for when it does right all the time uh what lies beneath is what i would say all right uh mechanics are done cycles are next and i don't have many for you see you in a second All right, everybody, it is cycles time here on the Weatherlight episode of The Receivables. And as you may have seen, we have a new sponsor here on the show. It's Original Magic Art. You can head over to OriginalMagicArt.store to learn more about the awesome Kickstarter that they're doing with the one, the only, Magali Villeneuve, who is known throughout Magic the Gathering for illustrating some of the game's most incredible planeswalkers and many of its most iconic characters, including Chandra, Torch of Defiance, Leovold, Emissary of Trest, Calyx, Destiny's Hand, Narset, Parter of Veils, Gandalf the White, and the newly previewed at Magic Con Chicago, Oko, the ringleader. Magali has teamed up with OMA Store to offer a limited edition collection of licensed Magic the Gathering playmats and prints, both gorgeously extended to see the full scene. The Kickstarter has over 2,100 backers. It has been pledged over $187,000 with about two weeks left to go. If you want to join in on the fun, click the link in our show notes and support one of the most awesome Kickstarters we've ever seen. All right, let's dive into the one cycle that I have here for Weatherlight. One, it is the Sacrifice Auras. Each of these common aura enchantments can be sacrificed for an extra effect. I've got five of them, one for each color. Big surprise. Kithkin Armor, save your jokes. Phantom Wings, Coils of the Medusa, Fire Whip, and Briar Shield. So as an example, uh, I will I will load up Briar Shield because it's a card I used to play when I was a kid. Of course. Single green, Enchant Creature. Uh, nowadays we call him an aura. Enchant Creature gets plus one, plus one, and you can sacrifice the Briar Shield, and Enchanted Creature gets plus three, plus three until end of turn. It's Stuff a fun like design. Yeah. yeah. Cool. I think this is a good cycle. Yeah. Um, I think that all five of them are pretty cool. I'm going to look at the Kithkin armor real quick. Uh, that was single white. Enchanted creature cannot be blocked by creatures with power three or greater. Sacrifice Kithkin armor. Prevent all damage to enchanted creature from one source. Okay. These are all pretty inoffensive, pretty simple. You want to dive into creature enchantments slash auras a little more. Okay. I, I think I think Briar Shield is kind of the best of the bunch. Okay. Um, I, I don't like the... I'm not as big of a fan, I should say, of the uh fire whip more of the same okay just okay now i can deal two once in a while yep or the uh kithkin armor here's two basically unrelated things sure briar shield is you kind of know what you're signing up for uh and it is totally like okay so i can keep this or and have the small advantage or i get this one shot burst for a bigger advantage and it's especially satisfying in the case of briar shield because most of the times you would choose to sacrifice it would be in a spot where the creature and therefore the briar shield is going to die anyway. Yeah. So it yeah. feels free to yep. do the thing, even if it's not really free. Yep. That design is really sweet. And I don't mind the intent here of having some structure. And I don't think this, these cycles are bad, but I think briar shield is, there's a reason that one got played the most. Part of it was great, but also part of it was that's a fun design. That's yeah. that's a that's a cool experience, and some of these are a little too fidgety or too convoluted to figure out when you're supposed to do the thing or not. And that one's really clean, really straightforward. Uh, Weatherlight also has two matched pairs. Uh, the first one is Follow Worm versus Harvest Worm. Now, Harvest Worm we went over in the last section. Uh, I'm gonna go over that one again real quick. It's the two mana three two, uh, ETB. You must return a land from your uh your excuse me a basic land card. Uh, from your graveyard to your hand. Yeah, they figured out this thing in strip mine real fast. Yeah. <laughs> Just so right. you know, that was much. not lost on them during this. A <laughs> little too much. Uh, and then there's Fallow Worm. And Fallow Worm is two and a green. So three mana, four, four. When Fallow Worm comes into play, choose and discard a land or bury Fallow Worm. Uh, they were both, uh, both worms were drawn by the same person, which is Stephen L. Walsh. And they have similar flavor text. Fallow Worm says the worms wake. And then uh, 
harvest worm reloading says the worms weave. So like, this is kind of cool because they're interconnected and Mm -hmm. then the bigger one costs more and that lets you discard the land. And then the harvest worm gets the land back, but it's smaller. Are these great cards? No, but like from a design perspective, I actually think it's kind of cool. It is. And it does give a certain structure to the set insofar as you've made the comment. There's no, New mechanics, and a lot of the mechanics that are here are not really build around mechanics anyway. Not like you build a cumulative upkeep deck or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. So it is kind of nice. Those two cards plus Rogue Elephant have a sort of, okay, you can get some oversatted creatures, but they are hard to play on curve. But a lot of their, you know, drawbacks are mitigated by the Harvest Worm. So, okay, that's a thing to think about. Maybe I can find some other cards that fit into that sort of structure. I would say the... Uh, Hidden Horror, Buried Alive, Circling Vulture, Spinning Darkness collection of cards says, yeah, there's a there's a deck here. It involves finding creatures that are good to reanimate or good to uh, end up in your graveyard somehow. And you get some like oversetted stuff. I guess that is kind of my criticism of both the green and the black experience here is the output is just stats. Sure. And maybe you're getting a good deal, maybe not, but you're not doing anything particularly novel or interesting, but it does add a certain, oh, okay, well, these three cards clearly go together. Maybe there's some other stuff that I can fill out with, and maybe that stuff is just other good green cards on curve, or maybe it's stuff that speaks to the land synergies. Who knows? Uh, I was a rogue elephant player. Who wasn't? But just one man at 3-3, you can't just just give that away for free. You kidding me? You got plenty of force to sacrifice. But this is actually, I, I do love the design of Rogue Elephant. Insofar as a lot of Magic's designs in this block are sacrifice some lands, kill the opponent. Yeah, <laughs> it's sure. like, okay, well, that's not really much of a drawback if they're dead. <laughs> sure. So the Fire Blast, Caravax, Spite Experience, whatever. Yep. Uh, the cards that have a lot of intense drawbacks in this set are really explicitly not about killing the opponent on the spot. Rogue Elephant is as far away from that as you can get. It's a one-mana creature that just attacks. Yeah. You can look at Firestorm. Firestorm certainly has some combo applications, but your opponent has to play along for you to get killed by it, or the game has to go in this really weird space. It's true. It can be extremely mana efficient, and some of what you're getting is damage, but it's not really fire blast you while you're at four that's not what's going on here so much yep so i appreciate that the negative drawback stuff is they actually mean it unlike fire blast or caravex bite and so if you want to play with these cards you have to be exploring the synergies that go along with them and not just playing them on rate Uh, that's a good point that's a good point uh speaking of cards where you sacrifice stuff to make it happen uh our other our other uh, matched pair here, Patrick found, uh, was Lotus Veil vale, uh, versus Scorched Ruins. Each of these lands require you to sacrifice two untapped lands as they enter the battlefield to gain an effect. So we'll start with Lotus Veil, vale, uh, which will remind some folks here of Lotus Field. Uh, when Lotus Veil vale comes into play, sacrifice two untapped lands or bury Lotus Veil, vale, and then you can tap to add three mana of any one color to your mana pool. For Scorched Ruins, when it comes into play, sacrifice two untapped lands or bury Scorched Ruins, and then you can tap it to add four colorless mana to your mana pool. So these are somewhat matched and mirrored pairs. Um, you know, ETB, sacrifice two untapped lands, and I can generate a whole bunch of mana. We have not, uh, to the best of my recollection, seen a uh, Scorched Ruins, not reprint, but like update. An homage. Yeah. Like, what? you know, we've got we've got Lotus Veil. Vale, we've got the fixed version in Lotus Field. Yeah, yeah, fixed all right. Fixed. Uh, I can't imagine they would go. You know, let's let's prevent. Let's excuse me. Print a, a new version of Scorched Ruins, but stranger things have happened. I want to call out these two designs because I just love the discipline here. This is a time where strip mine is still around. Okay, and there's a bunch of really good stone rains all over the place. Yep, even cards like Winter's Grasp, Thermocarst, Icequake, that we sort of took for granted at the time would be hugely influential cards if they were legal and standard. Okay. That's how good the stone rains were at this time. Yep. So you got these lands where, first of all, you had to sacrifice a bunch of lands. It's not the easiest thing to do. Yep. And then if it gets blown up afterwards, 
talk about putting all your eggs in the basket, right? Sure. And so a designer could look at that and say, well, we're not, why would we print these? Or we need to put something on there where they can't be destroyed or whatever. And sometimes the art of design is saying, I don't care if it's bad. This will have an audience. There's going to be people who are drawn to this sort of thing. We don't have to make it powerful. We don't need to find a way to work around all the drawbacks that this card could potentially have for the user. They know what they're signing up for. Yep. And if they like it, great. And if they don't like it, also fine. Right. Yep. Instead of trying to put shroud on it. What if it got blown up? I don't know. You go play another game. <laughs> okay. Like, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. I really appreciate that. Uh, the discipline there, even though, um, you know, it didn't see much play as a result because of all the reasons that I mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I told you the cycles portion would be short because we got one cycle and two matched pairs. So that's it for cycles. Now here's the good news. If you're enjoying this episode, uh, the trivia, and notable cards portion is a little bit longer and it's coming up right now. All right, everybody, it's time for some trivia, some fun facts, some FFs. Let's see what we can, uh, let's see what we can learn here from Weatherlight. Uh, all right. I got two functional reprints here, partner. This isn't the most exciting of things. Cloud Jin is a functional reprint of cloud dragon from portal. Mm hmm. And then uh, Fallow Worm, which we've talked about quite a bit here on this episode, is a functional reprint of Thundering Worm from Portal. Okay. So, yeah, for you trivia fans out there, out there, if that ever comes up in your life, you got the answers from us. You're welcome. Thundering Worm. What an atrocious card to put in the Portal. Look, they don't know. Uh, <laughs> we have a notable card section here. And, uh, again, this is mostly because if you, uh, you find folks in the YouTube comments that were like, hey. You should try to find some room to talk about like the good cards in the set of it'll come up naturally in the other stuff. Well, this episode's been pretty short because don't have a lot of information about weather life because there's not a lot going on here because it feels like it was just kind of designed quickly, I guess I would say. I don't know about quickly. There's a lot of cool stuff here. It's just incoherent in the rest of the block. But that's as much the fault of the people that made Mirage and Visions as it is weather life. I think there's a lot of blame to go around. Definitely. There's no shortage yeah. of blame. So let's talk about notable cards. That if you're a spiky magic player like me, but I also imagine some of these cards come up in Commander. We're just going to talk about some notable cards from Weatherlight so Patrick can actually be right about saying it's there's some cool stuff going on here. Abeyance. Yeah. Let's start there. <laughs> Let's start there. Really overrate. I mean, people love silence. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it, it is a very appealing effect for players of all ability levels. Mm-hmm. And has something of a tournament resume. It does. This is an absolutely cooked version of that. Oh, yeah. This version is horrible by comparison, but it was the first. It was the OG. No, it's, it's well, it's really strong insofar as what are all the times when silence is bad? It's so like when you just need a real card. Yeah. And this is the opportunity cost is so low because it draws a card. Yep. Uh, I remember this card when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to own it because I saw all the big pros playing it. Yeah. But I couldn't really afford it. It's still actually kind of expensive. Yeah. Uh, I guess actually, you know, that kind of makes sense because it's not any other sets. Uh, cause I'm looking at it on Scryfall right now. So Weatherlight, there's some gold border versions and then I don't know what the hell this is. What do we got? I here? mean, I wouldn't be surprised if this was good in CDH or commander or whatever. Oversized league prizes. That's right. I don't know what that is. It's a massive card so that when you are preventing your opponent from gaming, taking game actions, you can okay. hit him with it. You hit him in the dome. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next up, Aura of Silence. Mm -hmm. Another fun card. Let's see what we got here. I'm going to be miserable during this. Uh, one white, white. Artifact and enchantment spells cost target opponent additional two to play. Sacrifice Aura of Silence. Destroy target artifact and enchantment. Sweet design. Was this was this in Replenish? Um, Maybe in some lists. I don't know how much they overlapped. Okay. It was definitely an Oath of Druids Enlightened Tour target. Okay. Shows up a little bit here and there. Against the people, this is good against it's sick. Oh, it's very good, yeah. <laughs> that's that's for sure. Uh, our next card here, Imperial Armor. Mm -hmm. So one dub-dub. I know this one well. One dub-dub uh, aura enchantment. Uh, target creature gets plus X plus X equal to the number of cards in your hand. That's right. I think of this, uh, whenever I think of this card, I think of Matt Lindy. 
mm-hmm. in his uh his I think he won was it like a world championship with white it was Nats yeah with white, white lightning. Weenie? it was white lightning yeah. right because of Wale yes right 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 okay um also I didn't play limited d- during this time but there's no way this card wasn't bust and limited yeah so this really swung the nature of the draft format because Imperial Armor and Walking Ballista were both so so good Walking Ballista uh or um. Uh, or heavy the, ballista, heavy ballista. Sorry, yeah, he- I remember heavy B. Yeah, yeah. So like, good luck with that one. Yep. All the best creatures are two two flankers. Yeah, so like you're locked. Yep. So yeah, Weatherlight. Weatherlight was one of the most imbalanced lower rarity by color sets for limited of all time. Okay. The white commons were just so much better than everything else. Uh, our next white card, Peacekeeper, two and a white, one one. Uh, upkeep cost of a memory serves one in a white, or you bury the peacekeeper. Creatures cannot attack. Shout out Reed Duke. Mm-hmm. Players championship. Yeah, twenty fifteen. Sure, let's call it. That's that. what I want to say. Brought this in his miracles deck, almost exclusively for Tom Ross playing. In fact, I think it was also. I think Ross Marion was also qualified for that tournament. It may have been good against his elves deck, but I remember. Uh, some talks before the show of just like, is Reed going to bring like a peacekeeper? Is he going to like really metagame to try to beat specific people? Uh, yes, it showed up and it was good. Yeah, another one of Magic's uh, long history of single card white lock pieces that are theoretically balanced around the fact that they have an upkeep cost. Mm-hmm. Doesn't really matter if your opponent can't do anything for the rest of the game. Yep. Whatever. Very conversion adjacent. Miserable design. At least this one has the, well, maybe I want to get rid of my own Peacekeeper mm. and then free up my attackers. That's There's at true. least some plausible deniability as opposed to conversion. When yeah. It's like, yeah, of course I'm, just, I'm keeping this up for the I whole actually game. don't want you to ever cast a spell again. <laughs> this hold turn, on. Hold mm, on. I I'm, think still we're gonna, sh- <laughs> I'm still sure. I'm still sure I don't want you to cast a spell for the rest of the game. Okay. Uh, Serenity now. One and a white enchantment during your upkeep, bury all artifacts and enchantments. This is an enchantment. So basically you play it and the next turn it kills all of them. Yeah. Including itself. Cool. Another, I mean, this is. It it has dope artwork. Dope artwork. A little weird to do this in the set with uh, Aura of Silence too. It's kind of the same story. Whatever. Showed up some in tournament decks for the reasons you'd imagine. (laughs) Uh, Blue cards. I got a couple here. Disrupt. Mm-hmm. You've done some disrupting in your day. I've been disrupted. I've mm-hmm. disrupted people. Uh, single blue counter target instant interrupt or sorcery spell unless it's cast or page an additional one. Draw a card. Uh, for those of you who designed the magic online cube, put this in there. Let's have some real fun. Uh, and then I've got Ophidian. Two and a blue, one three snack. Pay the the I like the. I like the templating of this card. Zero, draw a card. There's more, which is pretty important. Ophidian deals no combat damage this turn. Use this ability only if Ophidian is attacking and unblocked and only once each turn. Uh, this is what, Randy Bueller? Who yeah. won with blue with this? Andrew Cuno, Eric Lauer. Yeah. Randy Bueller, like all the, CMU the, guys? the CMU crew back in the day. Yeah, so for those of you who aren't old school folks, uh, there was a deck, and you can correct me about this because you were around then, uh, Forbidian. Yeah, I think Finkel had a resume with it too. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and it was Ophidian alongside the card Forbid, which is not out yet. It came out in Exodus, which is one blue, blue, uh, counter target spell, buyback, discard two cards. Mm-hmm. And you basically accumulate resources with Ophidian, and then you have cards to discard to Forbid. <laughs> pretty poor job of balancing here i would say i think that it's bad to balance an unlimited draw engine around the idea that when it's going the game does not end sure (laughs) because they don't take any damage you will notice that scroll thief and future designs that are ophidian ish yeah it's like yeah they did they they deal the damage like let's (laughs) let's, (laughs) I, i don't I don't want to have to wait for this person to find his third affidian <laughs> so he can be drawing two off the first two and then dealing deal one, one with, with the third. <laughs> sure. Right. Sure. Even something as, you know, like thieving magpies. Yeah. yeah. That even dealt the damage. Yeah. Magpie, they figure it out by destiny. Yeah. And like, all right, let's make, let's, let's wrap it up here. Uh, okay. Those are the blue cards. Let's talk about some notable black cards. You mentioned buried alive already. Yep. Two and a black sorcery. Uh, search for three creature cards. 
in your deck and put them in the graveyard. Super cool. Yeah. Uh, very black design, which is super cool. Uh, saw plenty of competitive play. And I like this execution a lot more than the future uh, iconic one in this class, which is Entomb. Mm-hmm. Entomb is so extreme. And so, you know, well, obviously, I'm just getting the best thing just to reanimate it. That's what the story is. Yep. Once you're talking about three creatures, it's, oh, well, I could get a mix of stuff or I could care about having a certain number of creatures in my graveyard, right? Yep. You can play it alongside things like Necrotog and have an engine going that way. Uh, so setting aside the rate, the fact that one mana versus three is just very different. Yep. I like that Buried Alive is a lot more aspirational in that, oh, I could have a mix of things that work together rather than in Tombs, very straightforward, just get the best thing to bring back. Uh, other notable black card here is Doomsday. Mm-hmm. Uh, black, 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 pay half your life, round it up, put your graveyard on top of your library, then remove all but five cards of your library from the game, put the rest on top of your library in any order. Uh, there are, of course, Doomsday decks in Vintage, and it was recently added to the last run of the Vintage Cube, uh, which alongside Thassa's Oracle and Jace, one of the Jaces, I'm told. Dark, is that of Will? No, it's definitely not that one. I think it's Jace Yielder of Mysteries. Uh-huh. But now I'm going to Google it. Yielder is not right. Uh, but I'm yeah, I'm just going to throw that into the mystery machine here. Yielder of Mysteries. Let's see what it... Wielder! Okay, sure. Uh, I mean, really not that far off if you think about it. Jace, Wielder of Mysteries. Uh, if you would draw a card. Right. Uh, while your deck is empty, you win the game. Cool, cool, cool. Um... Yeah, I mean, Doomsday is a really weird card. I I will say this is, I don't know who thought of this card. It's a cool idea. Like, it's a cool design to just, like, I'm all in. Yeah, there's a, there, there's the nugget of something very cool here. And this card was not an issue until the card pool got much larger. Sure. Even like there was Doomsday decks out the jump. Yeah. And Magic had a history of cards like, let's say, Lich in Alpha. Okay. It does facilitate some combo stuff. And part of the appeal here is the game is so extreme and so different okay. that it feels very black. It's much worse in the world where it's facilitating one turn kills the way that it does now in Legacy. But for 1996, 1997, it wasn't like that stuff was on the radar. It was. I know you like to say it's cool to have cards to think about. That yeah. is a card when you see it. It's just like, oh, boy, I wonder what I can do here. Right. Because there's the buried alive thing, too. Right. Where. You can just get five really good cards and hope that that is enough to win the game in the allotted time frame. Yep. But the card is suggesting to you, find a way to make the five cards interlock somehow where you're winning the game. Yeah. Much like Buried Alive, you can just get three boom booms you want to bring back. That's fine. People did that. Yep. But it does suggest to you, you should be looking for like a combo here to make it really sing. Uh, I got a couple of red cards I want to discuss. The first one is Fervor. Two and a red enchantment. All is it all creatures or all your creatures? All creatures. Is it all creatures get haste? Okay, so all creatures you control. Oh, it's you. Sorry. Incorrect. Control. Yeah, I remember as a what kid. Am I, thinking of? I remember as a uh, you're, yeah, you're thinking of the crossroads. Yeah. Uh, I remember as a kid, I was a huge fervor fan. Of course, it's an awesome design. Uh, yeah, my my creatures are going to kick your ass now. It also is. It's good against the right people. So yeah, it's also true. All sweeper person who's not playing with creatures is going to really struggle with this. One of the better ways to fight against fervor is blocking. Just have a creature back the block. Sure. Um, so it does go after the right people. Uh, and then Firestorm, which we mentioned briefly in this episode. Single red, instant, choose and discard X cards. Firestorm deals X damage to each of X target creatures and or players. This one is a little... I, I don't know about how, how I feel about the ones that are really leaning into the rules knowledge of targeting firestorm caused a lot of confusion. I think of um, hex in original Ravnica as being that sort of thing. Yeah. You need six targets. You need to have exactly that. And firestorm's got a little bit of that going on. Ideally the mana cost and the play pattern is so extreme that it somewhat clues you in that it's something else is going on here, but the man, this is again, this is the mandatory fun experience, right? Yeah. You have to, you have to do it for this to, do the thing you want to do. Sorry, that's just how the rules work. Yeah. Uh, green cards. We already mentioned Rogue Elephant, so I'm going to save us from that. Gaia's Blessing. One in a green. Uh, was it Shuffle in, shuffle in three? And so if you cast from, if you cast from hand, it's a green a call us. Uh, shuffle up to three cards. Yep. And draw a card. Yep. And then if you mill it. Right. 
you shuffle that and everything else. Back everything in. else goes back. Yeah. In. So uh, the dishonest way to use this card uh, in oath decks. Remember, this is before my time. So correct me if I'm wrong. Oath decks. If you oath, if you turn this over like an oath. Cool. You get to like keep doing your thing. Right. That was one. Uh, there was like some like block constructed decks. Maybe when I think it was in time spiral block or uh, just like get to use my resources again because people love stuff like that. Yeah. So guys, blessing in time spiral block is the. The game's going to go on forever, and my specific bullets matter a lot. Yeah. So I'm just shuffling in the best stuff, and there's no combo necessarily, but if the game is going to go on for a really long time, if it's a control mirror that's going to go 20 turns, I am going to get a pretty sizable advantage out of it. Yep. There's the second thing that you talked about, probably the more common implication uh, or yeah, manifestation in a tournament setting, which is the... I'm somehow milling myself and this is allowing me to go on forever. But really what was going on with this thing back in the day was it was just low hanging fruit to put in against millstone people. Same way that oh. you see Eldrazi, Eldrazi decks, right? Like okay. you have one Emrakul and part of what's going on there is your opponent's trying to deck you in one turn, you shovel back in, you can keep going. Millstone was a pretty powerful strategy at the time. And even if not powerful, very frustrating. Mm-hmm. And having a card you could just put in your deck that if you drew it, worked it still did stuff even if it wasn't very good but if you happen to run into the millstone player it would be sick was uh i think a a reasonable bet to make at the time uh tranquil grove i'm just going to mention because i think it's also competitive play was one in a green as an enchantment you could pay one gg to destroy all other enchantments so if you were trying to do the enchantment thing uh you chose a bad time to do it alongside tranquil grove uh aura of silence what was the other white card a serenity right. yeah, yeah it's a tough yeah, I mean, and it it might be the weakest of the bunch. Yeah, because it's green, but the the green one is so egregious. Yeah, at least Serenity dies. Yeah, we'll move away. on with our lives. Nah. This is just Serenity forever. Push the button again. Yeah, and again, uh, and then Veteran Explorer, single green for you, Nick Fit fans out there. I know you're watching. Single green, one one soldier. If veteran explorer is put into any graveyard from play, each player may search his or her library for up to two basic land cards and put those lands into play. They would be untapped. Uh, each player shuffles his or her library afterwards. This card is a little too extreme for my taste, but I really don't mind going very hard after the people who do not play with basics, especially if you yourself have to play with basics to make the card work. This card also got updated to being a human soldier scout because mm-hmm. of course it did uh lastly we'll go over a couple of artifacts mind stone nothing crazy to note uh two colorless taps for a colorless and you can pay one in it and tap it to s- pay one tap it sacrifice it draw a card innocuous but super super good yeah busted uh phyrexian furnace a little bit of graveyard hate i liked this card a lot when i was young Me too. against my friends uh in the in the basement where we used to play so uh single mana Tap, remove the bottom card of target player's graveyard from the game. So that goes back to that graveyard mattering stuff that they tried to implement in this set. This is the bottom of the furnace. Yeah, no, I get it. Yeah, thanks, it's a story. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, you can pay one, sacrifice for Rexian Furnace, remove target card in any graveyard from the game and draw a card. I like having a lot of this in the ecosystem. Okay. Um, I think it's great that Tormod's Crypt exists as a design. It's very good against the most extreme people. Okay. And there's room for that. But often people's graveyard decks are not really set up that way. They're doing a lot with their graveyard, but it's not the entire engine and there's no need to respond on turn one. And when you're playing against those type of opponents, you really can sideboard in Tormod script. Like it's got to be shutting them out of the game. Oh, yeah. For it to be good. Yep. And if someone's just kind of doing some random stuff with their graveyard, it, while they're doing other things, Tormod script is often really, really bad. Yep. It's nice to give people the stuff where it's, yeah, it, it does the thing. And it can work some amount of the time against the most extreme stuff, though nowhere near as efficiently as Tormod script. But if you need a card that is low opportunity cost and works against graveyards, then, you know, you have your Relic of Progenitus, your Phyrexian Furnaces, your Soul Guide Lanterns, whatever. Mm-hmm. And I think it's it's nice to make some of those designs that can fight against the busted stuff a little bit, but more give you some anti-graveyard stuff at a low opportunity cost. Card you can play game one. I think it's good design space. Uh, I got Steel Golem, which is on each of the packs of Weatherlight. Uh, three mana, three, four. If memory serves, you can't play any other creature spells. Yeah. Yeah. So just uh, ideally bigger than what other 
folks are doing. Yeah. Oh, you can't play summon or artifact creature spells. Oh, okay, never mind. Never right. Mind. You just you can't cast creatures. Yeah, there were control decks that played this as pretty much the only creature. I think it some of the controlling more controlling builds of Necropotence played with that thing. Okay. It was just huge. It was yeah. Very hard to kill. You can't bolt it, blocks everything, avoids all protection from color conversations. It yep. fades a lot of the black removal because it calls out an artifact. So it, it showed up a little bit. I don't think it's a great it's not the most interesting puzzle to solve. If like I guess I just don't play with any other creatures. Yeah, sure. But it, it, it did show up. It's funny to me that there are probably some newer players that are looking at that thing and being like, people just couldn't beat this thing. Yeah, sometimes. That's not they three couldn't man. beat it. it just was, like three man, three four, it's just what's up? Yeah. Just in the up. house. Yeah. Can't bolt it, can't spin darkness it. Which was yeah. also a feature of the Necrodex. Yep. Contagion, good luck. Uh, and then uh, the last card I'm going to mention here is uh, Null Rod. Two mana. Uh, where is it? There it is. Two mana. Players cannot play any artifact abilities requiring an activation cost. Some of the best flavor text in Magic history. Uh, Ger- Gerard, quote, but it doesn't do anything. Uh, Hannah, no, it does nothing. Yeah. It's one of my favorites ever. Uh, I don't know. It shuts down moxes and a bunch of other nonsense. And it's also extremely expensive because it's not printed in like any other set. Yeah, I think it's reserve listed. Yeah, it's a hundred bucks. Yeah. Yeah. So nice, nice, really powerful card. Doesn't look powerful on the surface, but like if you play vintage, yeah, you're gonna need some null rods. Yeah. You need some of these. So uh those are some notable notables here. Uh and we were light on trivia, but we were fun on taking a trip down memory lane to see some cards here in Weatherlight. Now we go to the fun part of the show. We got some awards to dole out for our Weatherlight Award Show right after this. All right, everybody. It is now time for your favorite part of the show. It's our favorite part of the show. It's everybody's favorite part of the show. It's the award show here for the Weatherlight episodes of Sleepables. As always, we'll be starting with the Oko Thief of Crowns Award for best card in the set. My selection is lame. I choose no rod, not because it's expensive, but because it's really, really good uh, at doing the thing it's meant to do. And for the uh, spiky person that I am, it's hard to pick any other card. My answer is also pretty spiky. I gave it to a Bance. Mm-hmm. I, I try to answer this, you know, if there's some no doubt about it busted card in Vintage or Legacy or Commander, then that's going to get the nod. Yeah. And otherwise, I, what I usually go to is, what card from the set, if put into standard, would be the most impactful most of the time? Okay. I think a Bands clears that one pretty easily. Definitely not Null Rod. I, I should hope not. A little extreme. It'd be a weird for, standard yeah. format if that card was good. Yeah. Uh, Carnival of Souls Award for the worst card in the set. Your selection. I gave it a Xanthic Statue. It's, uh, imagine if Jade Statue uh, was just not efficient at all. Mm-hmm. Or good against the stuff that Jade Statue is supposed to be good against. Rawr. Eight mana, do nothing. Right. Then five to activate and turn to an eight. At least it has trample. Yeah. I give it that. A little a little something. But yeah. I mean, we're talking, you know, is that better or worse than Colossus of Sardia? It's close, it's, I guess. It's but it's like, it's a lot of mana to not get anything. <laughs> uh, Speaking of a lot of mana to not get anything, Wave of Terror. The definition of a lot of mana to not get anything. So, uh, this thing costs two and a black. Community of upkeep one. At the end of your upkeep, bury each creature with casting cost equal to Wave of Terror's last paid community of upkeep cost. You're gonna work really hard to kill anything. Yeah, you with are. This card. You are. You will die before anything good dies. That's correct. That is how that one. Just works. a horrific, horrific card. But you know, I think goodness, community of upkeep is back. Yeah, we found a new fun way to do it. Uh, let us take a look here at the Doomblade Award for the best non-rare in the set. I went with Ophidian uh, because, you know, we got those Forbidian decks that we mentioned, which we'll probably get to on the Receivables Tournament Edition at some point. Uh, and this is kind of an iconic magic card, right? Because they made a lot of different versions of that style of card. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, my vote went to Mindstone. That is correct. Yeah, Mindstone's super nuts and boltsy, about as simple as a card can get, but very, very powerful. Um, I've talked about before the distribution of rate. Like, yeah, you can mix and match abilities, but some mixing and matching of abilities is stronger than others. Mm-hmm. And 
it's mana, and then when you don't want it, mana, it's a card, is about as efficient as it gets. Yep. Because the times where you really, really want one thing, you probably don't really care about the other. And those two things coming together at a high rate, very strong. Uh, we move on to the Aboro Palace in the Clouds Award for fun of one of in the set. Uh, my selection is actually not particularly fun at all. It is Peacekeeper, uh, but it is kind of the ideal one of like you don't want a ton of those and the one that you do have is probably going to be more than good enough uh your selection i get a bozium strip yes. this is a personal kind of nostalgic award uh yeah eugene harvey this is just another one he put one copy in his decks and just kicked the crap out of me with it okay um you know just flashing back what you'd imagine just the spells of the time i like that eugene just consistently haunts you yeah, he informs a lot of these answers. If if a vote goes to a card you've never heard about before, almost certainly 25 years ago, Eugene was smacking me around with it. Uh, we have the Mystic Confluence Award for the best vintage cube card in the set. We both have the same answer. We're selecting Doomsday. Uh, but of course, Doomsday is only as good as uh, the, the vintage cube designer wants it to be. Uh, this last time around in the vintage cube over the holidays, it was quite good. Yeah, it's quite good. I enjoyed it quite a bit. Uh, we're going to go into the Smothering Tide Award for best commander card in the set. Do you remember your selection? I gave it to Peacekeeper. Oh, so much fun. I answer this through the lens of the spirit of multiplayer. Mm -hmm. And Peacekeeper, as you know, it's that. It's a multiplayer card. It is. The, very, table, it is. the table can care about it to varying degrees Yeah, and engage with it on varying levels. Yeah, There can be a negotiation involved with it because... The controller of Peacekeeper can choose to let it go, yep. depending on what's happening. It's a multiplayer card. Because every time we go to EDH Rec and look over one of these sets, it's just like, what wins the award? Some cantrip. All right, everyone. Very cool. Yeah, this I'm glad one, you're having such a good time well, that's playing what, with Consider or that, whatever. That's what I did, and my answer is super lame. Mindstone. Yeah, look yep. at you people. Obviously. It, your deck should have it. It's like having a soul ring in your deck. You should be playing that one too. Uh, Pack Rat Award for best limited card in the set. Now, I I forgot about your answer when I was doing this. So I selected Cone of Flame, which is also good. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah so Cone of Flame is 3RR. So it's a five mana sorcery. It better be a sorcery. Like, yeah, it is. Uh, choose three target creatures and or players. Cone of Flame deals one damage to the first, two damage to the second, and three damage to the third. Uh, so it's yeah. Weird to do in the set with Firestorm. We need another, like, scaling multi-target. <laughs> Whatever. Just ignore me. That's okay. That's also weird to do. <laughs> it's also weird to do all that enchant removal in the set, too. It, well, the, that much permanent, just just permanent tranquility. <laughs> it's just all Don't over even the Think place. about it. By the, way, <laughs> by the way, you have a cycle of auras in this set. That's what dead, too. Well, They're you all dead. sacrifice those you, to do you, stuff. you sure can. Yeah, so you it's not even right. like that's good. Uh, do you remember your answer? Uh, what was this again? Uh, the, oh, Imperial Armor. Yeah, yeah, dead to all the tranquilities. Yeah. Nice card. Well, you die before that happens. Uh, ideally. Imperial yes. Armor was one of the early, you know, when we're talking about Weatherlight, we are at the point where drafting and limited is a thing that people do, but it's very much a have and have not situation uh, when it comes to player knowledge and skill. Okay. I mean, even in this era, which is very like fledgling internet message board type of a deal. You could find a decent constructed deck in a magazine. If you just went out there looking for stuff, you, you could find an okay deck. Okay. Learning how to draft, you just got to take your lumps. You just got to lose, yeah. And, and especially in this format, because, you know, a lot of early magic and how players gravitate towards is big creatures, big creatures, big creatures. Okay. And Mirage Block is actually fairly aggressive. Like, there's a lot of just two twos for two and, you know, two twos for three that have combat-related abilities, efficient flyers, all that kind of stuff. So not only is limited complicated in the first place, but if you jumped in in this block, you would be lost for a while. Okay. And Imperial Armor was one of those, oh, if you don't know how good this card is, you have no shot. Yeah, you're If you're dead. not first picking this out of packs, if you happen to be white, or if you're not drafting with some level of, oh, I really need to take Man of War here because I need something that plays back against Imperial Armor, you are going to get thrashed. Uh, I'm going to go to the Char Rumbler Award for weirdest card in the set. My answer is Psychic Vortex. The winner of this is almost always a blue or a red card, at least for me. Uh, two blue, blue enchantment. Communal of Upkeep, draw a card. 
That seems beneficial. Uh, at the end of each of your turns, sacrifice a land and discard your hand. Well, maybe not so much. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's a weird one. Uh, I bet there's someone out there that's just like, I had a really good Psyche Vortex deck. I believe you. I just don't know what it would look like. Uh, Patrick, for you, do you remember your answer? I think I gave it to the Fungus. You gave it to Fungus Elemental. Fungus Elemental. All right. This is another one. It's actually kind of similar to the design you called out there of, wow, does it suck when you get to the punchline of this one? Yeah. Like, cumulative upkeep, draw a card. Okay, I'm expecting there to be a drawback somewhere here, of course. Cumulative upkeep, do a good thing. Yep. That's a little intense. This one's very similar. Green three, three, three. Okay, so far, so good. Okay. Pay a green, sacrifice a forest. Put two plus one plus one counters on that. Oh, uh, excuse me. Put a plus two plus oh, two sorry. counter. It's plus two plus two counter. Thank you. Okay, sure. I could. Sure. Yeah, that's a useful power to have. Play only the turn you play it. Well, I don't have any mana left. I <laughs> just played it. Nah, man. This thing just. And I don't know costs, if I'm going to. Cost five now. And I don't know if I'm going to get to attack with it. Yep. Before the thing. Before I get my va- my bonus off of the forest, I sack because I don't have haste. That's right. If you told me that thing was sacrificed as a sorcery, okay, cool. I get that. You don't want it to be this weird combat trick looming over the game. You want the person to commit to it a little bit. Yeah. But only the turn it gets played is pretty wild. I like what I what I like about Psychic Vortex is you don't even get the bonus on the first turn you play it. Yeah. You know, because you have to wait to get to the community upkeep right. part. Oh, so yeah. it's like you play it. You and then at the end of turn, at the very least, like let's say it's the last card you play, at the very <laughs> least, you have to sacrifice a land. That's just priced in before you even get to draw your single card because you're ideally empty. Well, you are empty handed after it happens. So it's like, okay, I draw a card. Uh, like if it's not a land, it's just like, okay, in the bin, another land in the bin. It's like, what are we doing? Well, that one, I uh, but something I appreciate about this design, I don't think you're supposed to do very much of this. I hope it's, not. it is. So extreme that most people just opt out. Yeah. There's something to be said for the Zuzam gins of the world where it's like, I really don't want to think about if this card's good or not. Okay. Like, sure, I maybe I can compare its power and toughness to other things at the same mana cost and try to weigh that against paying a life of turn and decide this is a card that's powerful. But there's a lot of people who just don't want to sign up for that experience. Sure. And but Zuzam is confusing enough. Where a lot of people go, okay, I guess I'm s- supposed to play with it, you know? This one is not that. It's not Juzam. So the only people who are going to play with this card are people who are signing up for, th- who are like, I want to figure this one out. Yeah, I'm in for the experience. I'm in for this experience. Yep. And another benefit about this card, and like a lot of the build arounds, re- like Azur's Weirding, for example, really doesn't affect your opponent very much. That's true. If you're over there mind twisting and stone running yourself, I mostly, I can mostly ignore that. Something might come up where I have to read, but a lot of the, the bizarre negative costed build arounds uh, of this era are very invasive towards the opponent. Yeah. This is not that at all. If I'm the opponent, the way it's impacted me is I'm just like, we do it over there for, for what it is. I actually think it is a good design. Okay. I don't think you're supposed to do very much of it. And you know, you certainly don't want that to be powerful. Like once you're in the land where it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm playing the Psychic Vortex deck this weekend. It's the best deck in standard. Then you've completely lost it. Yeah. And those cards are often way more powerful than they read. But the spirit of the design, I actually think is pretty sweet. Uh, Blank Award for best card name in the set. Uh, do you remember your answer? I love Gemstone Line. That's for Blank Award for best card name? Yeah. No. That's, that's not what oh, you Oh, Buried put. Alive. Nope. Nope. You said Null Rod. Null Rod. Okay. It's all right. There's a lot of really good names in the set. Okay, fair enough. Fair in terms enough. of in terms of matching mechanics to card name, this set is awesome. That I agree with you with. And and, and weirdly, my selection kind of does the same thing. Uh, I picked the extremely buff Maraxis of Keld because just the name sounds like someone who would kick your ass. Yeah. And in the picture, it looks like, I mean, this dude. Uh, yeah, he's on that Bane. That guy is roiding up. Yeah. He is. I don't know where he got his roids from. But my goodness, mm-hmm. Maraxis of Keld is gigundous. Uh, and then the John Avon Award for Best Land Artwork in the set, you said. Gemstone. There he is, uh, which does have very, very nice artwork. And I went with the Winding Canyons. Uh, this set only does have four lands in it, Gemstone Mine, Lotus Vale, Scorch Ruins, and the aforementioned Canyons. Uh, and they're all actually pretty nice pieces, which doesn't surprise you much because Magic has beautiful artwork on almost all of its lands. 
gems of mine is i remember seeing that card for the first time thinking like this is so cool it's a cool card it's a the cool story's card. so good yeah and the i get a five color land that comes into play untapped and i tap it twice with no drawback yeah you can tell yourself even at that time you know city of brass is probably just the most powerful of the time for normal decks and undiscovered paradise which came in the previous set has the most oh there's probably some cool synergies i can do with this sort of thing yep gemstone mine though is so clean and straightforward the story is incredible i love the art and i i love the fact that the the mine is exposed and there's a flashlight on the ground yeah it means it's been uncovered by someone we're in the process of mining it so oh i yeah when i saw that this card as a kid for the first time it's just that reaction of like what a cool game yeah it's like that's very high on the list for me uh, no Realist Fury Award for the most overhyped card during previous season, and no Tarmogoyf Award for most underhyped card during previous season. But I think with Tempest Block, I could give you, I could certainly give you an, uh, an overrated card and an underrated card for this set. All right, I'll allow it. Overrated card during previous season, Firestorm. People didn't know how it worked. Okay. They thought you could just go like turn one, like mountain, seven you. M- no, it was turn one Mountain Firestorm you five times. Oh no! No stop. <laughs> Or I could yes. deal one deal seven to you even without any other targets. Yeah, no. Yeah, no. so definitely overhyped during previous season because <laughs> sure. people did not know how it worked. No, that's not it. Underhyped okay. card during previous season for sure was a bands. Okay. People did not know just how messed up that card was. Okay, fair so enough. So I'll give some awards now. All right. Firestorm is a very funny answer, but it's true. Yeah, just sure. Uh, <laughs> just turn 125. What happened? <laughs> yeah. I'll keep. You're de- no. Yeah. I yeah. mean, Force of Will is legal all the time, so it's risky, right? They oh, sure. Yeah, you just turn totally your whole hand? Yeah. yeah, okay. All right. <laughs> uh, we've gone over all of our awards. This means we have one thing left to do. All right, everybody. It's time to close the show down, and this section of the show is sponsored by Coalesce Apparel and Design. You can head over to coalesceapparel.shop, the number one source for Magic the Gathering inspired apparel, to check out their selection of shirts, hoodies, stickers, play mats, and a whole bunch more. If you find something you like, be sure to use promo code RESLEAVABLES at checkout to save 10% off your order. Coalesce Apparel and Design, nobody made what they wanted, so they made it themselves. All right, here, partner. Uh, what card won the set for you and why? I want to give it to Buried Alive. Okay, explain. It is, I think, represents a lot of the best of Weatherlight. Okay. It is relatively simple. Weatherlight, I think, is a nice set from the complexity of things. Uh, the store, the the name and the art and the text box match. Very powerful image. It represents Black being very graveyard oriented in the set. The most of the black designs are speaking to the graveyard doing reanimation stuff, caring about your graveyard order, caring about having a full graveyard, all that kind of stuff. Okay. And it's definitely directing you somewhere because the card on its own doesn't do anything. Yep. So we're not talking about, Oh, this is a card with a cantrip attached to it. And I guess I can just kind of play it. It's no, it doesn't do anything unless you're leveraging your graveyard somehow. Okay. And because it calls out three, the experience of it is much more, how can I mix and match stuff in a way that's satisfying rather than how do I just bust out the biggest, most powerful creature as early as possible? Okay. Okay. It is a very nuts and bolts mechanical card, but in my opinion, the best designs in Weatherlight are nuts and bolts mechanical stuff that are very simple, very straightforward, but inspirational designs to think about as a player and buried alive for me is the top of the list uh my selection is veteran explorer uh i got i've gone with this card for two reasons one uh the people that like this card love this card you know for people who played nick fit and legacy which i can't imagine is even close to playable nowadays but there's still some people who might just try to do their green black thing sacrificing uh veteran explorer like cabal therapy whatever and ramping it up okay good for you live your best life uh and also, I like how it feels like it doesn't make any sense with the set, because the set doesn't really have like a land theme at all. No. It's just got this dude that when it dies, land time. Well, you have a little bit of a symmetrical 
thing going on the set like um uh noble benefactor noble something there's a blue card where each player tutors uh it is noble benefactor yeah well done and there might be another one somewhere too so there's this little sub theme of when this dies you and i both get to do something cool or fun okay it's nice enough yeah it's not really i mean you know it's also like of the cards of this set because i'm about to be really harsh in my grade um you know it is at least like hey i get to play two with the opponent assuming they have basics in their deck and okay i did the thing uh who can take advantage of getting this sort of acceleration more which ideally is the green deck so that's kind of cool to me it feels like a green card as far as my grade for the set I wasn't sure if I was going to waver on this number or not, but nothing about our conversation has changed my mind. Okay. I'm giving this set a two. I think this set is horrible, and I'm going to tell you why. Uh, one, it feels like it was designed by just a completely different team of people who have never worked on a Magic set before, which is not true, uh, because some of the names that designed the set, like uh, like Mike Elliott and Joel Mick and Dan Cervelli and people who developed the set, like William Jokic and Bill Rose, and, uh, Bill Rose, excuse me, Mark Rosewater, they've been on design development teams before this. It feels like this just is a set that got rushed out the door because remember the previous episode that we did was Portal and it seemed like if they had to focus on one or the other, they would probably try to focus more on the starter uh, product to get more people playing Magic and maybe the stuff that's after the starter product like Tempest Block. Uh, and the reason I say that is because uh, we decided to, we decided this was the third set Mirage Block even though it has effectively nothing to do with Mirage and Visions. Uh, there are no new mechanics. Um, they just decided to run back a bunch of he you stinky mechanics like communal of upkeep and uh, what else phasing and everything else the lore as you mentioned during our lore section has nothing to do with the previous two sets and it calls out a bunch of characters who are not cards in this set so that's really weird uh and they're cards in future sets obviously but they're not in this set um even something as simple as thran's tome being the expansion symbol as opposed to a ship after the weather light is a really weird decision um there's one cycle so there's no cycles really look forward to which is a weird thing to me it's just a bunch of individually weird cards like doomsday and abeyance and peacekeeper and a bunch of these cards that i've mentioned here and are notable notables in my opinion aren't particularly fun again abeyance or of silence if you like enchantment sucks for you peacekeeper if you like attacking sucks for you uh serenity if you like artifacts enchantments sucks for you uh doomsday that one's actually kind of fun and weird to think about uh, Firestorm, you mentioned the complications with that card. Uh, I don't know. Uh, the gems, excuse me, the Lotus Veil, was it Scorched Ruins? There's going to be some field bats and those get strip mined. So put a different card in your deck. Yeah, right? but also, like, if your goal is to accomplish, like, also, I would say that if you accomplish the mission of having Lotus Veil or Scorched Ruins in play, can't really say you're playing an honest game of Magic either. Scorched Ruins taps for four mana. Oh, I, I mean, yes, once you talk about people being any good, back in the day, people put Lotus Veils in their deck just to, just because uh, having a black Lotus in play was cool. Yeah. So, uh, for me, it's all very disconnected and it almost feels like, uh, as you mentioned earlier in the show, either what should be the first set in a trio or just a standalone set, and it's neither of those things. This is purposely meant to be the third piece of Mirage. But it doesn't inter or yeah, the third piece of Mirage block, but it doesn't interweave with any of that stuff. And then the best cards aren't really fun. I don't know. I think it sucks. And this this sucks for me to say because it's the first booster box my dad ever bought for me. So there you go. All right. I'm much warmer on this set than Cedric is. Um I give Weatherlight a four. Okay. I think a lot of what Cedric said is true. Um we might disagree on degrees, but I, you know, I don't disagree with the the true falseness of anything he's saying. But I do think there are some really good things going on in this set. If we set it, move on from the criticisms that you brought up. Okay, go ahead. Set's got incredible bang for the buck. The okay. number of cards in here that are simple to read, straightforward, but interesting to think about is exceptionally high and that is a hard thing to do i really appreciate that part of it okay uh i really appreciate that there are cards that direct you towards building decks without being overly prescriptive by overly prescriptive i mean you can look at goblin king goblin king's a cool design it's great but it is a little 
all right, well, you, you find some goblins. Something to do with this. Yeah, it's extremely straightforward. Compare that to, you know, again, the, the hidden horror circling vultures, buried alive, suite of black cards, or uh, harvest worm, fallow worm, rogue elephant. Okay. Those are all sort of telling you these cards kind of work together. It could be worth some investigation of finding some other stuff, but it's not just uh, tab A in the slot B, like Lord of Atlantis and Merfolk of the Pearl Trident. Okay. If if you and I looked at, you know, those cards and built a deck, knowing nothing else other than Circling Vultures and 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 Hidden Horror and Buried Alive, whatever, there's a chance that our two decks could look very different. Okay. While still taking advantage of that stuff. Okay. As opposed to our Lord of Atlantis decks, which I think are more likely to read similarly. Yeah, then they they can only read a certain way. Right. Yeah. Um, I think that the lands are very cool in the set. Uh, I I don't know if I like doing two five color lands when you only have four in the set, but again, still cool. And again, super clean, super straightforward. Maybe you're into the thing or not. Um, the drawback cards in the set. They're not necropotents where okay. I can't I can't even get my head around what the card is suggesting me is going on here. Okay, sure. The drawback sure. cards in this set are pretty straightforward. Yeah. Like, it's like discard this card. Doomsday, <clears throat> very transparent. Mm -hmm. Peacekeeper, very transparent. I'm not saying that all these designs are are good to do, and there might be too many of them in the set in general, <clears throat> but it's not necropotents where I don't even know what the drawback is here because sure. there's so many small things going on sure okay so i agree with it's disconnected shoe hoarding in the mirage and visions mechanics is bad the set is a little incoherent uh, as a result of all of that and that drops the grade down but i've often mentioned you know the structure of sets that matters a lot in the moment when it's the newest thing out and people are just trying to draft or build decks and think about the mechanics, you really need a coherent structure to guide people along. But once the set's not the newest set, once it's two or three years down the line, a lot of what matters to me is if you picked up a stack of these cards, would you go, oh, that's cool a bunch of times or not? And I think Weather Light scores pretty high on the, oh, yeah, that card's cool. Okay. And, and not okay. because the cards are overly long, but because they're what they do and what they interlock with is just novel stuff. Uh, this set does have a lot of fond memories for me. You know, there's a bunch of bad cards that I used to play when I was a young, young Cedric. So, you know, like Fit of Rage. Oh, yeah. One in a red. Target creature gets plus three, plus three, and gains first strike until the turn. I was super into that card. And my deck, I did have like three or four Thunderbolts. Thunderbolt is such gas. I, I loved this card. Just three mana, deals three damage to target player, four damage to target creature with flying. You know, I had it in my sideboard during one of the Restoration Angel eras yeah because they did like a reprint of it i just don't remember yeah when. I, I guess i can click on this card. it was like not not because it was good but because it's just cool yeah they, they reprinted it in uh avison restored yeah and i thought that card was super cool so yeah archangel avison just hit the shower <sighs> see you later smell you later uh all right let's do our uh let's do our shilling on our way out the door here everybody uh if you're watching this episode of the receivables that means you're probably watching us on youtube so if you're not already you could like subscribe and ring that there bell we'd love for you to do so um we are looking to get to twenty thousand subscribers ideally by the summer uh you can find our most recent episodes of the receivables our traditional edition like this episode here on weatherlight uh our most recently, we've also covered 5th edition and Portal, which you can find on this YouTube page as well. Uh, you can find our most recent episodes of the Receivables Tournament Edition, including our recap of Pro Tour New York 1996 on our YouTube page. You can find snippets of our Unsleeved podcast, which I'll talk more about because it is more of a Patreon-based reward than anything. And then you can, of course, watch our Crack-A-Pack videos as they come out. We publish them on our YouTube channel, uh, and we'll talk about how you can be someone to win one of these packs of Weatherlight here in just a second. Of course, that YouTube page is youtube.com slash the Receivables. Uh, if you'd like to join us on Patreon, you can head over to patreon.com slash the receivables where you'll get access to early releases of both the receivables and the receivables tournament edition. Uh, you'll get access to 
Unsleeved, our Patreon exclusive podcast that Patrick and I do record weekly. Uh, we talk about all sorts of fun things, and then we take a ton of reader questions, which have been very good lately. Oh yeah, I've enjoyed them They're quite a bit. The uh, and then you get access to our early releases of our Crack a Pack videos and the ability to win one of the Crack a Packs. Uh, Patrick, you want to tell them how they can do that? Oh, absolutely. So if you subscribe over at patreon.com, that's the receivables, and you subscribe at the $10 or $25 tier, one of the benefits that that comes with is being drawn into every pack drawing, every set that we review. We open one as a cracked pack video. The other one is given out to one of our subs at the $10 or $25 level. If you do subscribe at those tiers, you don't need to give us any additional information. You don't need to alert us to be drawn in. You're just automatically going to be put in there and weather lights up next. And then after that, we get into Wrath Cycle and Ursa Block. Boom. That's Tempest. That's Exodus and that's Stronghold. We already got these packs. We're ready for those Kraken packs and those giveaways. Uh, you can, of course, follow us on Twitter at The Receivables if you like to hop on that social media platform. We have some fun updates and behind the scenes shots that we do over there. And then uh, finally, we do want to give a quick shout out to all three of our sponsors of the show, Tales of Adventure, Coalesce Apparel and Design, and Original Magic Art. Now, what's next? Well, we've got the receivables, our normal edition, traditional, if you will. We'll be covering Tempest next, uh, a set that I feel is near and dear to your heart. Yeah, it's what made me quit magic for about a year and a half. I was unaware of that. But so, yeah, I do. I mean, I have some I have some fond memories of my creatures getting capsized over and over again. Ooh, with buyback. With buyback. Mm, and that sounds, being like, what am I doing here? That sounds nice. Uh, as far as the Receivables Term Edition is concerned, Patrick and I will be recording and publishing Pro Tour Los Angeles 1996, won by Sean Hammer. We think it's Regner. Regner is how I heard it. Actually. Well, uh, he won that tournament, and it was a limited event, and uh, the deck he used to win that event, it's a real humdinger, I'll tell mm. you that much. Uh, that's it. And that's all for Weatherlight, everybody. So for Patrick Sullivan, I am Cedric Phillips. Stay tuned after the credits for our wonderful art gallery of Weatherlight. John, don't put that in the episode. Or you gotta bleep it. <laughs> don't, don't, don't put that in the episode. <laughs> okay. Please, please. Okay, fine. You. Dad. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah, dad. Dad.